Okay. Some projects go good, some projects go bad, and some projects are just plain ugly. Hi there everyone, my name is Murray Woodman, I'm the Managing Director at Morph, and today I'm going to take you through some of the 150 uh, sites that we've built over the last 10 years. Um, I'm going to lift the lid on some of our successes and some of our failures, and just uh, hopefully come up with a few learnings that I can share uh, with you all. <laughs> it's, it's getting ugly, this one, Andre. Don't you worry about that. Um, yeah, so, you know, the title said we're, it's a retrospective, but really I probably should have included the word uh, burn-up chart uh, in the title because this is the lens through which I'll be having a look at some of our projects. Um, so, yeah, an anatomy of a burn-up chart. Uh, it's got a few features that you should be aware of. Firstly, there's the progress. That's the green line that goes from the bottom left to the top right. You can think of that as the mountain you've got to climb. Um, the the grey line up the top, that's the, the total number of hours in the project, and, and that will uh, increase as new tickets are added to the backlog. And then we have that dotted line going from the bottom left to the top right. That's the ideal progress. That's the average velocity you want to have have if you want to uh, deliver the progress, the, the project on time. Uh, I find this chart has a number of advantages. Firstly, it's understandable for the, the project managers and the, the team and for nosy people like me that want to sort of have a little peek to see how uh, a project's getting on. Um, we can also very quickly see uh, the velocity uh, of the team, but more importantly, that ideal line tells you what the burn rate it needs to be over the project. And that tells the project manager at the start how many you know, developers per time period uh, they need. So that's a very good uh, thing for planning. Uh, you also have the concept of scope creep. You, you don't get this in a, a burn down chart, but in a burn up chart, you can see that gray line. And uh, you know, as more stuff gets added towards the end of the project, that can be a red flag as well. And finally, it's very adaptable. It can be done on a per sprint basis, uh, a milestone if that's where you're working, or even uh, the whole project. So yeah, that's a, a quick anatomy of the burn up chart. Let's go to the videotape and have a look at some of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, the first, I'm going to start off with something good, um, because we've got to you know, get, the, get the show on the road with a, a good one. Uh, this particular project, it has been referenced a, a few times uh, in this conference. The great thing about this project is that we have a fairly steady uh, you know, uh, outcome there in terms of the work that's been delivered. We were ahead of the curve, that means we we're ahead of um, schedule. And uh, the little flat line you see there at the end, that's not such a problem in this case because it just means we finished with time to spare, the client can do the UAT and the client can add their content. And, um, you know, all up, this is sort of perfection in my eyes. But now that we've seen this, let's go on and have a look at uh, some of the other uh, projects we've done over the years. I'm just starting off with some bad things. No one ever wants to admit to being under skilled, but in this, this particular project was one of the first Drupal 8 projects we, were, we ever did. And we were really sort of learning on the job in a number of cases. You can see we got off to a, a really good start. But then we hit a lot of, you know, sort of flatlining periods there where the team really just wasn't uh, delivering uh, at a good rate at all. That could have been meant that we were learning or the client wasn't uh, reviewing things. But yeah, certainly uh, not, a, not a good situation. So we were, yeah, jumping ahead and, and uh, sort of flatlining a lot of the time there. The end result was that the, the project went over budget. The thing at the end there was really, yeah, the difficulty in getting the client to come to the, the party as well, which is another feature. Uh, another project a little bit similar, I'm calling this one Fits and Starts. Um, you can see there at the start of the project, we just had a, lo a lot of sort of flatlining periods. I mean, this is basically a week goes by, no tickets get updated, and the project manager will, will come in and, uh, you know, kick the project along a little bit. That's not great. You know, we want to see people uh, updating the tickets uh, as, they, as they go. It can be a sign that there's blockers or that the, the client is not sort of uh, reviewing and accepting work uh, as well. Um, the little gaps up there means that the, the team is not really reporting 
uh, on this progress. And you know, if you have bad data going in, it's much harder to know where you're, uh, where you're, how, how the whole thing's going. The most concerning thing here is that gap down. I mean, it's very, very rare for us to, to have that, but in this case it did. And this basically means we've had to pivot halfway through um, the project. We've delivered value, and then it's been decided that that was not good value. Obviously, not a good um, state of affairs. Uh, on this particular project, it was a very sort of technologically demanding one, and the, the client may have also changed their mind a little bit there as well. The, the great thing in here, though, is we were able to, to get back, uh, get the project back on track and, and uh, continue uh, the velocity. Um, so yeah, all's well that ends well in, in this case. Um, this particular chart here was another uh, large project. I'm calling this the hockey stick. Uh, you can see around January, the velocity picked up a lot, and that's because another developer came on to the project to, to help it uh, get some more velocity. Um, you know, as you know, uh, agencies, we, we, we know that it can be difficult to resource um, projects adequately, and we do our best, but sometimes we can't get there. In this case, we were able to bring more resources on, but really having this sort of hockey start, uh, hockey stick kind of a you know, chart is, is not a good look, and certainly one uh, to, to avoid. This is not really a problem with the project team. It's more the, the business owner or, or the, the person organizing uh, the resources. Uh, this one I've called the missing client. <laughs> you could go back to the start of Morph really for this one. This is in our very early days and we really sort of had no clue on how to run projects. Um, we've, we delivered to, in our mind, really, really well. And so, you know, the velocity was skyrocketing there. But then the, uh, I think the client went AWOL. They got sacked, they quit, whatever. Um, no one ever told us. Um, we have then found uh, another project uh, owner and then another product owner and another product owner. I think we went through about four. And each time they would come on and add another, another little bit of requirement there. It's basically a year of just living in limbo, which was terrible. There was also uh, content issues where they weren't able to, to do the content. The, the takeaway here is that um, you know, you've got to have that great relationship with the product owner and also there is a difference between you know, going live and actually delivering the project. So we really learned our lesson there. Um, the next one is the timid client. I know that sounds not so nice, but um, it, it sort of was uh, true in this case. This was a, a super massive project, three and a half thousand hours. I'm calling this the S curve or the sigmoid uh, for those of you into that kind of thing. Um, you can see we started off slow. We hit some good progress and then we were just really slow at the end. And this is because I think the project was so large that the client just sort of felt intimidated to get into it. It was like they were at base camp of uh, Everest and they just didn't want to sort of set off uh, on the journey. Once we got on the journey, it was okay. But you can see there towards the end we had scope creep and uh, that's when the client really started to become engaged at the end. And I, I find this a lot in uh, some government departments. People only really start to feel the pressure when the, the deadline's approaching. And uh, that was a hard one to, to get over the line there. Um, but we, we did get there. Another failure to launch. Okay, so good, good velocity on this one. And in this case, we were going to deliver on a certain date, which we did, but the client was going live three months later. So in their mind, they didn't have to worry about it until you know, the last month. And we, we're just in this terrible limbo of, um, of having this trickle of little bug reports and little featurettes and feature requests, and we were kind of just not in a, in a, in a position where we could, you know, argue with that, um, that, that final sort of uh, go live date. It's very hard to, uh, to avoid this sometimes, I, I think, especially when you, you're, you've got to conform to, to other people's uh, timelines. But yeah, certainly uh, something uh, you would like to avoid. Sorry about that. And finally, uh, a good one. Here, here we have uh, what I'm calling uh, an exponential curve where our velocity is increasing. On this particular project, the task is quite repetitive. 
Um, the developers are getting better and better each time they do it. Their velocity uh, is improving. Um, so we're getting better skill, better efficiency. But another awesome thing is we're working in total harmony with the clients on this one. We've got visual regression tests that we run across a whole suite of pages. The client's able to review that very easily and then approve. And this is probably one of the smoothest projects we've ever had just because of that uh, visual regression. And that's been a really big uh, learning from, for us and something we'll be doing more. Okay, so what about the takeaways? Um, firstly, it's a shared responsibility. Of course, it comes down to the client and the, uh, the delivery uh, team. We've, we've seen that in, in some of the good and bad points there. For the, the product owner, they must be empowered, present, and decisive. I've put decisive there because um, they have to be courageous you know, to make those hard decisions at the right time, but they also have to be motivated to, to get to the, the finishing line uh, as well. For the, the project manager, they have to be organized, attentive, and encouraging. They are the glue between the development team and the client. They have to give encouragement to both sides, give them a little nudge uh, when it's, it's time to, to get along. Um, and they also have to be motivated, keep uh, attentive to the progress of the, uh, the project and get to the finishing line uh, when it matters. Uh, the delivery team have to be resourced, skilled, and engaged. The resourcing and skill is really up to the, the, the person allocating the resources. But in terms of engagement, the development team, I, I really feel that they have to be communicative, alert to risk, being able to report uh, you know, troubles as they're coming, and you know, keeping uh, the, uh, the issues uh, up, to, up to date because you know, the charts you get are only as good as the data that's going in. Uh, so that's it. Hopefully you've enjoyed seeing a little bit of the good, the bad, and the ugly of project management, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. If, if you've got time. I've been in one of those situations before, so <laughs> thanks for going through Just could you jump back to one of the graphs? I just didn't really understand how they work. So is the grey bar total That's right. budget? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then green is spend? Yeah, yeah. So like on, on this one here, you can see towards the end, Oh, no, the green is basically value delivered, so hours delivered. Right. It's not how much time you've done, it's how many hours in your estimates that you've done. So if, if you've got a, a five-hour task and you spend 10 hours, you're still only delivering the five hours. Right. So it, it really is the progress that you've made throughout. But the gray line is how many, the total estimated hours for the, for the project. So if so you had a lot of those 10-hour in five-hour estimates, your green could be above the grey? No, no, the, the green, yeah, should be below the grey because it's just on the estimated. But just say here, it may, it may be three and a half thousand hours, but if, if your team has had lower than expected velocity, you may have delivered 4,000 hours in time. So you, you, if you're trying to work out profitability, you'd still have to look at the total hours spent. This is really just the, what you've delivered in terms of... What do you use to uh, pump those out? Oh, this is Redmine. Yeah, it's an open source yeah, issue tracking. Yeah, the old Redmine. Red yeah, it's been a faithful tool of ours from, from the start. And how often, how often do you look at those? I, I, for when, when we have big projects going on, I've always got them open in my tab. I shouldn't ask this question, but I'm going to. That, that hockey stick curve, please tell me that is something you classify as good, because that looked familiar. <laughs> No comment, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ideally the grey line would be horizontal right from the start because you're clear on the scope. What, what do you think is the biggest factor in causing that to climb up? Yeah, that, that's, that's a, a, a good question. Some, some projects, you, you got it locked in and you know, but re realistically, the, the project for us, we will sort of sketch out some of the core things and we, we have some flexibility in the issues that are, that are coming in. So we'll often leave a bit of time there for, for contingency or stuff that we know is going to come in. So we would expect you know, it to go up a little bit. But you are right. If you know the project down, then yeah, it should be horizontal. In this case, you definitely don't want to see that thing at the end because that means the client's coming in and 
throwing in curveballs and you've missed features that they really wanted that you couldn't really argue about. And uh, so, yeah, that, that kind of thing at the end is not good. But, is, but, is but it, having sorry, a, yeah. Sorry, is it because they hadn't identified it at the start or more than... The yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, a little bit of both as, as you go through, yeah. Um, and I, I, like another point I, I made is it, it, make, it makes a big difference if there's an intermediary. Like oftentimes we'll work with uh, a, a design agency and they, they're the, the prime on the, the contract and there's that little sort of gap between us and the client. That does make it a bit harder to uncover some of those those uh, tricky little things which tend to come out in the wash at the end of the project. But yeah, we generally we do like to have a bit of contingency there just to include those, those tricky ones at the end.